Hello and welcome to episode 154 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, Toyota raises the price of the Prius again in Canada to a whopping $10,000 more than what I paid a couple of years ago. Apparently, the money is going to the corporation's retirement plan. Not the employee's retirement plan, the company is retiring. The Vogel nuclear reactor has come online in Georgia, making it the first new nuclear plant in the U.S. in three decades. To celebrate this milestone, our podcast will now double its budget and release all of our episodes seven years late. Oh, Biden called on companies to make a better cold weather heat pump, and guess what? They have! They did it in less time than the two years it took the McDonald's chef in Canada to perfect the Big Mac, the chicken Big Mac, which is debuted across the country today, unfortunately. Interesting. And that, of course, was a result of a Trump era research grant. Air in the UK is getting cleaner as coal use has dropped to its lowest level since 1757. So we're going to party like it's 1756. Woo! And also on the show this week, we'll assist a listener who is on a road trip from Virginia to Nevada. And Tesla's Investor Day was actually about a sustainable economy. Brian, that means this podcast is essentially one big investor day. Plus, Tesla opens its supercharger network to non-Teslas, and this is a big moment for the future of sustainable transportation. And I'm surprised by how elegant of a solution they came up with. This and a bunch whack more on this week's edition of The Clean Energy Show. Yes, definitely lots to talk about this week. I want to start by talking about BlackBerry, which leads us eventually into the discussion. Have about you ever Tesla. had a BlackBerry? I skipped BlackBerry. I never had one, no. Did you? No, no, just uh, some Nokia flip phones and things like that. Yeah, so BlackBerry, of course, was at one time the leader in cell phones, a Canadian company, actually, and their cell phones had a keyboard on them, and uh, people loved their Blackberries. They called them Crackberries. It was really the first kind of... Obama you know, had more... one. All the members yeah. of Congress were using them. Journalists were using them. They had keyboards yeah. on them. Yeah, and, and people did like the keyboards, and a lot of people were kind of slow to give up the keyboard. But, of course, in 2007, Steve Jobs presented the iPhone to the world. There was a big presentation, and I was just thinking about it because it related to Toyota and what's going on with uh, EVs these days. So there was a story that – so it was unveiled at a 2007 presentation, and then a few months later, the phone came out, and people could actually see it. But there was a news story that came out maybe 10 years ago, kind of in the tech press, about BlackBerry around that time. And the story that they'd spoke to one of the engineers at BlackBerry, and they watched the Steve Jobs presentation back in 2007, and they thought, okay, well, this, you know, this phone looks great, but, you know, there's no way it's going to work. It, there's no way it's going to do all the things that they say it's going to do, because if that's true, the battery life would be like two hours. Like, there's, you know, there's no way this is going to work. Two hour battery life maximum. So, you know, they were not, they were very skeptical about uh, this iPhone that was about to come and, and disrupt their world. So then the iPhone finally comes out and they bought one at BlackBerry and they tore it apart and looked inside of it. And they opened it up and realized that 90% of the insides was battery. And that's how it worked. That's how the battery life was actually reasonable because uh, Apple figured out how to miniaturize everything. And most of the inside of that original phone was mostly uh, battery. But I just think about that because there was a story this week about Toyota. This was uh, reported in a few different places. Um, I read it in Drive Tesla Canada about a teardown. So Toyota, three years after it came out, have finally torn down a Tesla Model Y, which is their chief competition now here in the, the 21st century. So there was a story, I think the original story was in Automotive News, but been picked up a lot that um, one of the executives at Toyota, after tearing down the Tesla Model Y, you know, called it a masterpiece that this was Really? A, How do they know that? Well, you know, just from a you got, sometimes got to tear these things apart to really know what's going on, like what is, is Tesla actually doing. But, you know, unlike the BlackBerry engineers who tore the iPhone apart immediately when it came out, yeah. Toyota waited three years to do it. And this is already now the, you know, previous generation, basically. Of this Tesla is incumbent because, pride. This is the things that yeah. they overtook when they started out. 
But did they did they learn the lesson? Did they remember those lessons? No. Yeah, and Sandy Monroe, like he was part of this coverage of the the Tesla Investor Day that we're going to talk about, and he said at one time he spoke to the he's been involved in the auto industry for years, and he spoke to the the grandfather at one point, the grandfather of the guy who just stepped down as CEO, and you know back in those days they had an expression of always be dissatisfied at Toyota. That was their modus operandi, always be dissatisfied. And that way you're continually making improvements and, and getting better. But they seem to have uh, perhaps uh, strayed from that plan. So, um, Or they've you know, kept on it, but they've just looked inwards, like let's just improve what we have and uh, not think outside the box, which is literally what yeah. you do when you look at the competition's model. And they are still the world leaders. They make the most cars. They, you know, uh, it's it's not going to be for too much longer. But they've but... woken up, haven't they? they the sales numbers have uh, alarmed them once, uh, you know, a certain threshold was hit that they've, uh-oh. Yeah. Well, we, they could have listened to our show. We've been on the air they for three years. I mean, think they of the millions listened. they could have saved, maybe billions. Why isn't that money in my pocket instead of theirs? This week, we have a letter that says, good morning. I saw an article today about wind farms being a theory on why whales are washing up on the shores of New Jersey. I don't know if you saw that on the news, Brian, but they've mm-hmm. had a bunch of whales. And of course, the right-wing media in the United States says, wind turbines. They haven't even erected yeah. them yet. They just did the survey work for them. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, you know... They don't do survey work for offshore oil all the time, constantly. Nobody yeah. goes blaming that for anything. Uh, so he says, ludicrous, uh, embarrassing to be of the same country of people who believe it's wind farms, solar, sonar exploratory planning work that is doing this, yet we are the same people who are pushing for, they are the same people who are pushing for an expanded offshore drilling and petroleum land leasing approvals by the U.S. government. As always, I love the show. I'm saving up episodes, actually, at the moment for a cross-country trip from West Virginia to Nevada that I'm taking next month. I'm looking forward to listening for hours straight. Cheers. Tierman Mendez in, uh, I take it, Virginia? So thank you for that letter. And, you know, I I don't know how, if you're going to hate us by the end of the trip, if you're going to get sick of us, I don't <laughs> recommend listening to more than 10 hours of uh, Brian and I at any given sitting. It's like uh, if you have an erection after four hours of Viagra, it's probably not a good thing. So I don't know. It's... Of course, it's all bull crap what he's talking about, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, there's no possible way that, that uh, wind farms are responsible for, for dead whales. Yeah. But well, this is the kind of thing that comes out in the media sometimes. And this is the kind of negative story that um, we don't need to report on because the oil industry and the right wing media are happy to do that job for us. And of course, the story comes out. People remember that. They remember the negative story. They don't remember the story that comes out a few days later. So this was a story that I read in one of the papers. Uh, Increase uh, began of this whale desk before the wind turbine surveys. All the way back in 2017, they were starting to see an increase. So since December, more than 23 whales have washed up dead along the east coast of the United States, leading wind energy skeptics to lay blame on the pending installation. Pending installation. Not installation. Not instant pending. Pending installation of offshore wind projects. Wow. Uh, Some scientists with the federal government say that there is no evidence to support those claims. So we do not have evidence that would support the connection between the wind survey work and uh, these recent stranding uh, events for anything uh, like this in the last several years, said NOAA. Um, major environmental groups agree with NOAA's conclusion. Quote, there's no evidence that we've seen implicating wind turbines and the deaths of whales on the East Coast, Greenpeace Oceans Director John Hoskavar said. Well, have a safe trip uh, to from Virginia. To, that's, that's a lot of miles. That's 2,400 miles, Brian. That's a lot of yeah. miles. So watch out for trucks. Ah! <laughs> Christ, that'll wake you up. Also, helicopters yeah. might be a problem. And uh, helicopters that take shots that you watch out for those. And, uh, oh, I've got an idea here. Uh, it's worth it. If you, I looked at the trip on the map. If you take mm-hmm. the I-64, it's worth it to detour a bit north to see the world's biggest basket in Newark, Ohio, Brian. <laughs> okay. It's quite something. I put a picture of it in the script. When you do, please pause the podcast, okay? 
So I want you to pause the podcast right now when you get to the basket, and uh, then we'll just do a little audio uh, tour of the basket. Welcome to the world's largest basket, located in Newark, Ohio. Roadside America writes, it is in this modest city that humankind has erected the grandest monument to the highest pinnacle of achievement by then advanced consumer culture, the handwoven gift basket. This monument is in fact the world's largest basket. It was built as the seven story corporate headquarters of the Longenberger Basket Company. The basket is a replica of Longenberger's medium market basket, only 160, 160 times bigger. A uh, good thing they didn't choose the XL Yogi the Bear uh, basket to replicate, because that would have been much bigger. Mm -hmm. Many of the blankets, many of the baskets company's employees were astounded when they moved into their new home office on December 17th, 1997. Yes, apparently the boss went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the giant building and basket cost the company $32 million to construct. Much more expensive, uh, you know, than a normal building. The entire region around Newark remains basket happy. In nearby Dres Dresden on Main Street and 5th, you'll find the old headquarters of the basket company still standing. A house-sized picnic basket. <laughs> that is 23 feet tall and 48 feet long. So, Brian, they started in their little basket house with their basket company, and they grew approximately 60 times. Okay, so tours of roadside attractions is, I guess, an, a new segment on the show? Yes, it is, Brian. It is. Okay. Thank you for visiting the world's largest basket. And now back to more of your binging of the Clean Energy Show. There you go. What's a service to our listeners? I try to help out whenever possible. We need to give back. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the sentiment because I do the same thing. If I'm on a long road trip or something, I will save up episodes of a favorite podcast. So thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate it. And if you or anyone else visits that basket, let us know how it is. Or perhaps you already have visited it or are familiar with it. Drop us a line, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Okay, so we're going to get on to Tesla Investor Day, which happened, I guess, a week ago today. It was a massive three hour long presentation and started with a plan for how to change the entire economy of Earth Major away plan. from fossil That's fuels. That's a big plan. It's bigger than a basket. To sustainable energy. And uh, yeah, overall, I thought it was great. I am a Tesla investor since 2019. So as an investor in the company, I thought it was fabulous. I wish more companies had a plan for transitioning away from fossil fuels. But of course, this is core to what Tesla does. So, um, yeah, they just spent three hours talking about all the different things that they're working on. And they're not the first ones to propose really, you know, how we're going to switch to clean energy. We talked about Mark Jacobson's uh, book recently called No Miracles Needed which does the same thing, solar, wind, and batteries with maybe some hydro and, and nuclear. It's not that difficult to get off of fossil fuels. You know, we just got to move faster, which was also one of the the, the comments from the, the Tesla presentations. Well, Brian, for me, I, I'm worried that this is what I wanted to hear, but I wasn't sure with the craziness and the headline making of Musk doing terrible things to terrible you know, to people and, and on Twitter, just being a horrible person. I wondered if he'd lost focus on what the mission was, but they have not. So that's a relief to me. They had such a large group of people presenting, like the heads of various departments and divisions. So it, you know, it made me feel good about a sort of a post-Musk succession plan that clearly all of these people working as heads of these different departments are, you know, this is a company now that has over 100,000 employees. So, you know, Musk is still in charge, but, um, you know, clearly he can't do everything. And so, you know, I felt pretty confident about uh, the, the people that they've got running these uh, different departments. You must have had about 15 of them on stage. Yeah, did, you know, a three-hour presentation and, and then a bit of a QA. and a at the end. So, um, yeah, so let's hit some of the highlights. Well, the next generation model that they're going to build is going to be built in Mexico. 
So they announced or confirmed, I guess it was out already, kind of, but they've confirmed a mm-hmm. Mexico factory. How are you about that? Yeah. No, it seems like a good idea. I think somebody said it's going to be the largest building in the entire world. Like, so this is a massive factory that sort of looks like it's maybe double the size of the, the factory in Texas. So, you know, they want to spread out their manufacturing in different areas. So I, it sounds like the idea is now that they'll have a cheaper car and to serve the the kind of Central American and South American markets. So um, I think that's why they put it in Mexico. Yeah. So they've got four cars on the market and plus the Cybertruck and the Tesla Semi. And what everyone's been waiting for is maybe a lower priced car, but then they also say that what North America doesn't want that. Yeah. But of course, in lots of markets, um, you know, uh, South America and and China and India, like, you know, cheaper car is essential, again, for just getting the world off of um, fossil fuels. So, uh, yeah, big plans for a very high volume car coming out of Mexico. And one thing I noticed they mentioned was that the 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 next motor that they're going to come up with, they're known for their motors, but the next one that they come up with is going to have uh, eliminated rare earth materials, which seems almost like, how do you do that? Because there's magnets involved and everything. But 50% of the factory space will also be reduced for this motor manufacturing. So yeah, that all leads to lower cost vehicles, which leads to higher adoption, which leads to a better planet for you and I. So it's all important stuff here. Yeah, no, the eliminating rare earth metals, they didn't really explain how that they're doing that, the details of that. But um, if they said it, I, I believe that they have somehow achieved that and improved the efficiency of the manufacturing at the same time. It's all very exciting stuff. Yeah, they're, they're, they they think about mining too, right? They're, they're not just thinking about the manufacturing the, and, and they're thinking about what they need for mining. They also interestingly said they didn't want to get into the business of mining because uh, people had asked them that, the reporters afterwards. They said, mm-hmm. we don't want to, but there's yeah. places where we need to, where we see a choke in the supply chain. And one of those places is lithium refining, refining, which yeah. they're getting into a little bit. Yeah, and because they have this roadmap for what the entire planet is going to need to shift to sustainable energy, they have a pretty good idea of what we're going to need in terms of lithium and nickel and all these other sort of uh, minerals. So, um, yeah, they they have announced some plans to do with uh, lithium refining, but it's it's sort of a call t- to arms for other people to get into this business. Uh, everyone's going to need lithium in the coming years. So if you want to start a, a lithium refining or mining business, it's probably a good idea, something you'd uh, make a lot of money at. And again, getting back to their overall plan, like one of the negative things you often hear about the switch to clean energy is, oh, well, this is just going to increase all the horrible mining that goes on um, around the planet. But according to their calculations, once we eliminate the mining that's needed for the fossil fuel economy, the total amount of mining should be less than what we're doing right now. And that seems reasonable to me. And just the fact that because the fossil fuel economy is so inefficient, we we talk about this a lot on the show, like it's super efficient to have, you know, like solar panels on your roof and the energy, you know, if that can go directly into the battery of your car, you've got incredible efficiency, like 80% efficiency with the energy that you're using. But with, you know, combustion vehicles, you got to dig up the oil, you got to refine the oil, you got to transport it. And then you got to put it into the engine of your car, which in itself is not efficient. There's all kinds of waste heat generated from, you know, so... Uh, I thought that was a really great statistic that once we switch to the clean energy economy, we actually need less energy overall, like half, half the energy that we need now because this new economy will just be way more efficient. Are you listening out there, people? Because I get questions like this all the time. Yeah, Isn't what you're talking about going to create environmental disasters of mining and ripping up and destroying the earth for your batteries and for your energy storage? And the fact is, is, is the kind of the opposite. You're reducing the amount of yeah. uh, mining that you need overall. And it's, you know, it's it's not perfect. And, you know, we should probably all just grow our own vegetables in our front yard and just walk everywhere. But in terms of, you know, keeping the, the planet running in a similar fashion, 
This is just a way more efficient way to do it. Uh, another interesting thing about the Tesla Investor Day is that they said that their next model, and I believe they said this for the Cybertruck too, correct me if I'm wrong, that they are going from 12 volt to 48 volt architecture. Now, everybody who's familiar with the car knows that we have got 12 volt batteries in there. Why do you have that? You, yeah. you have it to start the car, but it's also there to run all the electronics. Your radio, your fan for your heater, and your lights, obviously. There's a lot more in cars to use up that electricity now. There's sensors, there's self-driving control modules, there's powerful computers and powerful infotainment systems, all kinds of stuff that the way electricity works, if you change it to a higher voltage, you need smaller wires to deliver the same amount of electricity. So that's going to result in 75% less copper in the wiring of these cars, which is great. And that also means uh, a lot less weight. It's it's many kilograms less of weight. And it's also simple, so it's cheaper overall to make that, uh, they think. And they're encouraging the auto industry to do the same. They say it uses only a 16th of the energy, so you get more fuel economy for your battery size or a smaller battery or whatever. Like, it's it's all good. No, that's amazing. Yeah, they said everything from the Cybertruck forward is going to be this 48-volt architecture. And, yeah, this was indicative of many things that they mentioned. It's, it's you know, they're going to achieve this cost reduction for the cheaper car that they've got coming out that will come out of Mexico. Um, but it's not just one thing that's going to make it cheaper. It's not just, oh, okay, we're making the batteries cheaper. It's we're making the batteries cheaper. We're making the wiring cheaper, you know, um, you know, fewer parts. It's, it's, um, it takes many, many things for them to achieve this kind of, you know, basically 50% reduction for what is their current cheapest car to make. Another interesting thing that's come out of this is they've talked about sort of having and being an energy company, at least starting in Texas. You know, they sell yeah. insurance to Tesla owners. Now they're selling energy to Tesla owners, which is great. Yeah. And I'm amazed by this. It's $30 US a month for overnight charging of your Tesla. I mean, it's unlimited at that rate yeah. over a month. So the Texas has a lot of wind. A lot of it blows overnight. So they've got excess power and they've arranged deals with the utilities there to sell it as a base rate of $30 a month for Tesla. Char I don't know how they're going to figure that out. They might, you know, Tesla has the information themselves. Maybe they pass that on to the, or I hopefully you don't have to install an expensive meter just for your Tesla. No, well, I, I think it'll be just with the existing thing. Like it'll have to be a Tesla car and it'll have to be a Tesla home charger because both of those things can talk to the internet and presumably talk to the grid. So I, I think that they can make this happen with just the, you know, existing infrastructure. So yeah, they're going to become a power utility, but basically a virtual power utility that can apparently just talk individually to certain customers and, you know, yeah, deliver unlimited overnight charging for 30 bucks. We've talked about before, there are some places that already have super cheap overnight charging. It just depends on what kind of power is available on your grid. And um, yeah, so Tesla's taking the step. That seems amazing to me. I'm hoping we get demand charging where we live so that we can save money charging our EVs overnight on the timers that come built into the yeah. cars. We're still waiting for that here. Now, $30, already have it. $30 a month might be what a lot of people will pay already, right? If you've got a fairly low price for electricity where you are, and it varies yeah. from region to region, state to state, country to country, province yeah. to province, but... If you've got a fairly low rate and you don't do a heck of a lot of driving, in fact, if you probably do an average amount of driving and you're in a not too cold of a climate, uh, say the so southern half of the continental United States, you're probably going to spend around $30 a month. But if you're an Uber driver or somebody like that, I wonder if they can participate because that would really increase their income, Brian, if they could get yeah. away with doing that for 30 bucks a month. I mean, they have to charge overnight, so they'd be sort of limited to that one cheap charge per day. But if you can drive your Uber... All day, basically a dollar a day for your fuel, which is amazing. And some people can do, I, I remember looking at the stats, if you have a long range Tesla and you're in a warm climate where you're not using the heater, you can do that and uh, make it a whole day. And okay, maybe occasionally you have to do a bit of a bump up with the supercharger in places, but I still think that would make your, your income a lot more palatable. Um, and speaking of which, some of the very first version four Tesla superchargers have now been, uh, they're just setting them up in Europe. The first ones are being installed in Europe. So the the Cybertruck they've also mentioned is going to have a like a thousand volt architecture for the charging. So uh, this is the next That's version of this a thousand? supercharging. 
Yeah, so they did picture a wireless charging thing in one of their, you know, display pictures. So that was interesting. I've learned, Brian, that it's become, it used to be a problem with efficiency. You'd lose a lot of your efficiency going wireless, but apparently it's almost negligible now. They've improved it so much. Yeah, so there was a teaser image in one of the slides that they showed at the, the Tesla presentation, which showed a wireless charger where you you drive on top of a pad and yeah people have talked about this kind of thing before but it tends to be kind of inefficient so i think that's the main reason it, it hasn't gone mainstream so yeah perhaps uh, tesla has figured that out and we'll get wireless charges and you have to add you know weight and stuff to your car to receive that charge sort of yeah. a big magnet to receive it under your car i don't think it's People are going to be clamoring for that unless you're just infinitely rich and you just, you know, who cares? I'll spend an extra few grand on that. But um, it's not that hard to plug in your car is what I'm saying. No. It's pretty easy. Yeah, plug in your, yeah. Especially you do it every night. And if you're a Tesla, fine. you push the button on the Schmengi. And did you get your, you, you didn't get that done yet, your charger installed? No, it's not installed yet. But yeah, I, that's, I bought a Tesla home charger just so that I have the button on the handle, which makes it even easier. So you basically grab the handle and your little flap opens on your car. And and then when you want to stop charging, same thing. You press the button and just pull it out. It's yeah. the easiest thing possible. Okay. This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. We're going to move on now to uh, nuclear power, a fun topic that we discuss regularly on the show. So there is a new nuclear power plant that has come online in the U.S., in uh, the state of Georgia, the Vogel 3 a uh, nuclear power plant has finally spun up. And, you know, this is largely good news. I was making a joke about it off the top of the show. It is, of course, late. And it is, of course, over budget, as all of these nuclear projects seem to be. So about seven years late and double the initial budget, which I feel like we've seen worse figures than that. Yeah, we have. And I thought this one was yeah. worse than that, actually. But yeah, it's it's basically the only new nuclear that's coming online in the States anytime soon. And it was supposed to come online a long time ago and be a lot cheaper. So every time there's a... Yeah, it's, it's largely because they didn't know how to do it anymore. It has, yeah. Nuclear has gone out of favor. And since even all the way back to Chernobyl, and there hasn't been a lot initiated after that. Now, if uh, we want to be optimists here on the show, which we love to be, then maybe they will now have learned because this is the first new Well, that's what they're plant. saying. I don't buy it though. It's one no. one power plant for a whole generation of power that has to be built in the next 12 years, Brian. Also, I'll mention it is a um, generation three plus pressurized water reactor, a PWR, mm -hmm. which is the first of its kind in the U S. So this is some slightly different design that's never been done before in the U S. Yeah, There's a few new kinds of designs. I think some of them even use salt water or some sort of sodium, uh, solution. And, but the same people who say that we're going to learn from this also say, well, we have to start schools where all these people need to go to school to learn how to build that. Well, I don't see any schools being built for nuclear, so I'm I'm not <laughs> convinced. Yeah, and going quickly is a big part of this. And again, that was another nice thing about the Tesla presentation. They're they're talking frequently about going as fast as they possibly can, and uh, this is what's going to help us transition. Which we got to transition as fast as we can. And so the addendum to this story about the new nuclear, um, this is from Electric. The previous story was from uh, Power Magazine, but Electric reporting wind, solar, and batteries will make up 82% of the 2023 utility-scale uh, U.S. energy being deployed this year. So 82% of the energy being deployed on the grid this year in the U.S. will be wind, solar, and batteries. 82%. And that is the 18% the is including that damn nuclear reactor. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And I, there's a lot going on with solar and battery storage and wind, and the economics are taking over. In fact, even the International Energy Agency is is saying the same thing in that it's it's going to be a large part of the grid fairly soon. Yeah. And, you know, solar, as we know, is dirt cheap and getting cheaper. Adding batteries, it's maybe not the cheapest thing once you add batteries, but of course the cost of batteries uh, is coming down as well. They have their own take on things and, and they are improving things and coming up with different applications. A lot of them 
uh, would work well for grid storage. For solar panels, of course, like bifacial solar panels is now, you know, kind of the norm. And, yeah, we heard you know, about that and you think, okay, well, how long till they commercialize that before it's free? Next thing you know, I find yeah. out that they're installed next door in the f field of farm next door. Like it's just, it's suddenly yeah. standard. I mean, there was no press conference. It just happened. And <laughs> even here... Uh, where we live, things like that are are now standard to have bifacial solar panels. Yeah, no improvements happening rapidly. So Tesla opened their supercharger network um, to a small, I think, what is it, 10 different sites in the United States. Most of them were in the Northeast. Yeah. One or two were in California. And the second that happened, well, two hours after the second that happened, YouTube videos started to appear. It was kind yeah. of like a very interesting experience to see them on YouTube. It was great. The one I saw was Marquez Brownlee, uh, MKBHD, and he had his Rivian and he went to a Tesla charger to charge his Rivian. And then another YouTuber pulled up in a Ford F-150 Lightning. <laughs> and was struggling. You know, he, he's got... He's got like 20 million subscribers, so he was able to give a nice plug to the other guys. But the funny channel. thing is I saw the other guy's video first, and then I saw Marquis's <laughs> video. Yeah. And then I saw the podcast he was on. He was actually from, yeah. is he from Clean Technica? I think that guy yeah. who does the... But, but yeah, basically the first day was all YouTubers. But and he called it, him Marquez know, by see. accident. He was talking about how, oh, I was just, damn it, I called him Marquez the whole time on his podcast. So. <laughs> It's funny, they all showed up and they were all testing and to and people drove various distances to get there. But I mean, if you're a YouTuber and you're making content, I mean, that's what you got to do, right? You got to go be oh, the yeah. first to get the views and the, it's worth your while. Yeah. So in Europe, this is an easier problem because in Europe, they standardized on the CCS charger. So Tesla cars and all non-Tesla cars in Europe have the CCS connector. So opening up the network to non-Teslas, not a big deal, but in North America... Tesla cars use the Tesla connector, other cars use CCS, so they had to come up with this clever magic dock, and as the YouTubers showed, it seems to work. I was impressed with how elegant it was, the whole experience, because I was wondering for a long time, well, how this is going to be awkward. Yeah, I thought they'd have adapters like hanging on a chain or something. Yeah, 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 or been... <laughs> maybe a separate cable altogether, which would add expense and it wouldn't be too slick, but they've got this, the same place where the Tesla cable plugs into it just plugs into something a bit more bulky and black and what it does is it locks into a adapter that might cost two three four five hundred dollars who knows often they do cost that much money that adapts it to the ccs standard now the tesla standard is better but this is the world we live in so they have to come up with this big giant end that locks on when you yeah. here's what you do brian i'm just going to go through it so I was really impressed with how well the uh, Tesla Magic Dock adapter works because it seems to be flawless. You download the Tesla app if you don't have one, if you're not uh, a non-Tesla driver. And that app, you just set up an account with your credit card as you would with any other app. And you pick a location where you are. It'll look at your GPS and find out where you are. And then you just pick the stall number, like might be 8A or 8B or something like that. And you just say, Do, would you like to un click the you know click here to undock the the dock unlock the dock i can't it's hard, that's hard to say mm -hmm. plug it in and you start charging so you just click you hear a little click and you push it up and pull it out and plug it into your car and after 10 seconds of the car talking to the charger and they say it actually works faster than some, you know, Electrify America type chargers too. I would think so. And yeah, you sort of have to push the test, the connector up till you hear the click, then you pull it out and it's got the adapter attached and the adapter is locked onto there because there's mm -hmm. a locking mechanism in already in the Tesla chargers because when you plug it into your car, it locks in so that it can't be yanked out and you get um, electrocuted. So yeah, super elegant because, and then... You just put, when you're done, you put it back in the same spot. And then if the next person comes along and they have a Tesla, they just pull it out normally. They don't have to pull out the And the adapter, the adapter stays there and it. they don't, they're none the and wiser. It, yeah, it seems to work. Now, there are a few little issues. I was disappointed with the uh, uh, Seth from Electric, friend of the show, who uh, was one of the first people on the scene with his Chevy Bolt. I was curious to yeah. see that. And <laughs> he just pulled it out like a, like a Neanderthal. He didn't push it in. So he just yanked it. <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to shout at the screen. <laughs> there is a bit of an issue, though, because uh, the Tesla uh, charging ports of cars are in a bit different area than everybody else. So you have to sometimes take up two stalls. 
you're occupying yeah. a, a stall that would normally be occupied by Tesla, and so two chargers yeah. are taken up. Uh, the cords are often not long enough. They've one guy that Marquis helped had the one inch clearance, like he had to get within, you know, yeah. a hair's width of that charger to get his uh, cable in. But the V4 chargers that are coming online in Europe reportedly have longer cables. So that will solve that problem because all you need is a bit more there. Maybe another foot or two would do the trick. Cars don't charge to the full potential all the time due to technical differences in the cars, the mostly the voltage. So the Bolt was able to take full advantage if it was empty and uh, warm enough because that's only 50 kilowatts, remember. But the uh, Hyundai Ionic 5, those cars from Korea have 800 volt architecture, which charge very quickly over 250 or so, right? Watts, yeah. kilowatts. So there's some sort of translation issue between the slightly different voltage. So yeah, some cars can't take full benefit of the full juice. But you have the option of this network as a backup, which in itself is great because everybody's having problems yeah. with the charging networks in the States, except for Tesla's. So yeah, it's a backup. I mean, it, it sounds like if it goes poorly, you'll still get 50 kilowatts, which is, uh, you know, not the worst. Not the worst. And... Not great, but it doesn't leave you stranded, that's for sure. You know, you're not buying a hotel room because, you know, 16 of the 18 chargers are broken somewhere. Yeah. The, it does cost more. I think they put a 20% premium on what Tesla owners pay, and Tesla owners are already charged a fair bit for charging now on the highway. It started pretty easy, but now it's gotten mm -hmm. bigger. Yeah, so Tesla cars have standardized on having the charge port in the, you know, the rear left what do you think car, about so. that? I've never asked you what you thought about that. I'm kind of curious. It's always slightly awkward because you have to back into the charger. And so sometimes I have not parked close enough because even for the Teslas, the cable is kind of short. So you kind of have to, you have to park pretty uh, precisely. But I think that, you know, there's some people like, you know, the, the Ford F-150 Lightning really struggled with the cable not being long enough. So I think depending on what kind of car you have, you know, the, like F-150 Lightning drivers will probably learn to use the Electrify America network wherever possible um, because, you know, parking in or, or you have to end up taking up two spots because you've parked, you know, maybe your charger is on the left right side and then you're using the wrong charger, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, definitely not a perfect experience for, for non-Tesla users and also, you know, maybe not getting full power. Well, hopefully, but hey, hopefully they can improve some of that things fairly easily. Yeah, it's a start. And some of them have like, drive forward charging stalls. So those should work well for people that have their port in a weird place. Um, so, it, you know, it's just a start and it's a, a promising start. They seem to have done it on low use uh, stations uh, yeah. where they're not going to, you know, they can learn from it. And, um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with how elegant and easy it is. It's not that big of a deal. Now with a Tesla, all you have to do is have an account and plug in and you're done. Yeah. Because it knows who you, who you are because it'll recognize the VIN of the car gets gets transmitted and it'll charge your account and that's that. Yeah. That's fantastic. But no, this the, is the, the next Tesla best experience thing. is the best, but this sounds like this app experience is a, uh, a close second and probably better than most of the other uh, chargers out there. So we have a story from Carbon Brief, UK emissions fall 3.4% in 2022 as coal use drops to its lowest level since 1757. I can't now, remember 1757, Brian, and I'm fairly old. <laughs> yeah. I I was I'm kind of disappointed, you know, you'd you'd think that with all of the um, modern technologies we maybe would have gotten to this milestone a little sooner than this. Um but this is, you know, basically they used this, the same amount of coal in 1757 as they're using now, and we're just finally starting to uh, drop a bit lower on that. But yeah, this is in the UK. Uh, the air is cleaning up. And the other thing that we're starting to read in some of these kind of stories is that, yeah, emissions are going down and air is already starting to get cleaner. And it's not necessarily tied to the economy. We're starting to break away from that fossil fuel economy. So even though emissions are going down, the economy is still growing over this uh, period. And that's one of the exciting things. And I, you know, I've seen other stories like that. Um, of course, everyone has been worried, like if you're a government, you don't want to ruin the economy of your country. But now that we're starting to become detached from this fossil fuel economy, 
the economy still can grow as emissions are dropping, which was not the case, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. 266 years is a, that's a chunk of time, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. And it makes me think of, I've mentioned before on, there's a Netflix series called The Crown, which is about the monarchy in England. And there's a great episode in the first season. It's the fourth episode, season one. Ah. And it's about the Great Smog of London, yeah. which was in 1952. One of my favorite episodes and, and also... It's a great episode. It's it's a real sort of history lesson. And ten to 12,000 people died in 1952 as this smog set in on London from burning coal. And it was just the particular weather patterns were just inversion. really, yeah, there was an inversion going cool on. Cool air so it under was, warm and uh, stagnant, yeah, it, and it just, it was nasty. London has been brought to a halt by dense fog, which has descended overnight. Long queues have formed on main roads, and there are reports of motorists abandoning their vehicles and continuing on foot. London Airport is expected to be closed. Good God. The Meteorological Office has issued a statement saying that a persistent anti-cyclone over London is to blame. Smoke from the capital's chimneys is being trapped at street level, which is aggravating the fog. Windless conditions mean it is expected to last for some time. Be careful out there, it's a real pea super. And eventually, it the weather changed and it just all blew away, but not before ten to 12,000 people died. And, you know, here we are in 2023, finally starting to go down on our coal use in the UK. Um, you know, you'd think with that history that they may have gotten rid of their coal uh, sooner than that. But, um, you know, it is what it is. As a monarchist expert, was it true that uh, <laughs> Winston Churchill's assistant, young assistant, was hit and killed? Is that true? With the smog? Yeah. Yeah. I, that is, I believe that is true. Yeah. The, the show does sometimes take liberties with the truth, but I think the the, the fact basis for that show was, was fairly Yeah. Accurate. That was so bad that you couldn't cross the street safely. Like, that's just nuts. Yeah. And like, like before, they didn't believe the scientists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an age-old and problem. And then suddenly people are dropping dead and, uh, you know, they decide to do something about it. And then just quickly in addendum to that... Um, a story from The Economist this week, war and subsidies have turbocharged the green transition. So according to The Economist, they think that uh, about 10 years has now been knocked off the timeline for the switch to clean energy with the recent wars in Europe, which have... Um, Brian, that's freaking amazing. Like, that's just... Yeah. I'm gobsmacked to hear that, even though I suspected and we heard inclinations of that being true with 10 years yeah. come in that's crazy 10 years knocked off the transition timeline because of wars and the new subsidies that have recently come online which is very encouraging yeah that's um joe biden and you know my son asked me the other day via text I, we get into political discussions he said who's your favorite president of the united states in history and i had to think and i was you know and uh obama was part you know, as a lefty, Obama was popular, with, but he didn't do the things he said he was going to do. And I, I thought about it and I said, you know what, Joe freaking Biden, I think he yeah. is by far my favorite US president on what he has done. He's actually done it and he continues yeah. to do it. I mean, he's got this, this thing where he's forcing, if you want the subsidies for something, you have to have childcare at your company. That's unheard of for the United States. You know, yeah. that's European socialism. And not, not the bad kind kids. I think it's good to have childcare and so that women can enter the workforce. The, the clean energy bill is a big deal. It is a big deal. And if you don't know it, look into it. It's bigger than you can. We tr try to to explain it here on the show, but it's just, it's, it's quite amazing. And I think even the people, climate scientists and climate advocates, they, they're continually amazed by it. Like six, eight months later, they're still saying, wow, did you know this was in there? I mean, that's incredible. And this and that. And yeah, it's just, it's a big, big freaking deal. And so is the war. Thank you, Mr. Putin. Undecided with Mark Farrell. He was, he's living off the grid, Brian. He's got building a whole new uh, factory built home 
that will rely on solar and a heat pump with geothermal, not air source, yeah. but geothermal. And he's in the U.S. Northeast as well. Yeah, like a prefab home built mostly in a factory, then you set it up and assemble it at your place. Yeah, and that just is a more efficient and more precise way of doing it. And also uh, it works well because your, your construction time is shorter in bad weather because that can really add to delays and cost yeah. overruns and such. So um, heat pump innovations seem to be getting better. In fact, the usability seems to be getting down to around minus 29 and colder and minus 20 Fahrenheit uh, and a bit lower. So train, Lennox, and carrier. I have a train furnace, by the way, which I recommend to anyone because mine has not broken <laughs> after 13, 14 years. And one or two others have already met this challenge that Biden administration had to improve heat pump performance for cold weather. And they wanted it to go far beyond minus 15 Celsius and five degrees Fahrenheit, which was common for heat pumps. And by God, after a couple of years, they did it. And, you know, there's uh, two or three companies have already said that they've done it and they're going to bring this technology to market. Lennox is one of them, and I think Carrier is another one. Train has not said when they're coming to market with it, but they've said that they've got it. So they've 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 accomplished this in two years. I mean, we're just starting. The thing is, Brian, we're just starting this. And... They've already said, hey, can you make them better? And they did. <laughs> yeah. Just like, So I think as heat pumps take over the world, the innovation is not done yet. No, and I'll mention again the, the Tesla presentation. So they had a plan to get the world off of fossil fuels. And for their math that they did, 22% of the problem can be solved with heat pumps. So every furnace on Earth that runs on natural gas is going to have to be eliminated and replaced with a heat pump. And once we do that, that takes care of 22% of uh, worldwide emissions. Again, that YouTube channel, I was going to play a clip, but I'm going to skip that. It's uh, Undecided with Matt Farrell. He also had a clip during that uh, video where people at a cottage were putting a, a loop in their lake. And I thought of you, you know, huh. it was a flexible loop. It wasn't like drilled into the ground. They were just sort of, and they said 600% performance or something from using uh, Okay, so water. it's like geothermal, but instead of digging into the ground, yeah, you just Yeah, well, it's like what your... they do in Toronto for the cooling, except you're taking the heat out of it yeah, and the cool out of it, or you're putting the heat back into it in the summer. Well, I wonder, my lake is not that deep, so I have a feeling maybe it won't work as well. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not an engineer. I no, don't Brian, you're not. You're not an engineer. I wonder if it even needs to be deep, because... Uh, even if it's a block of ice, um, would it, I don't know. I'm not an engineer. Yeah. I guess if you're heating your home, it might be better if it's shallow, like the, it'll stay warmer. You want it to stay warmer. Yeah. But you probably don't in, want it to be a block of ice either. You want it to be warm enough not yeah. to freeze so that it's. In, in Toronto, they use it for cooling. Right. But, but this, you're talking about using it for heating. Heating and cooling. So yeah, improving okay, the both. efficiency of both. So it's, it's, it, yeah, you're right though. It's like using the ground, but perhaps better. Um, yeah. Although, would they let you do that at the lake because it's a provincial park and yada, yada, yada? I don't know. Yeah. Environmental Probably study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Millions of dollars. Uh, but I thought I would mention that anyway. Okay. So a story here from Electrek. I just wanted to mention this quickly because we mentioned recently, a week or two ago, that the EU had voted to ban combustion vehicles by 2035. And we mentioned at the time it wasn't the final vote because there's several stages on this, but apparently Germany is having second thoughts now. So this has not in fact passed. When we mentioned the story a couple of weeks ago, it was basically just going to be a formality, the final vote to approve it. But now Germany is stepping in and they're saying, well, maybe we should have some biofuels in there. So Germany's having second thoughts. So Italy, just wanted to mention it because Italy and talked Germany, about it. Brian, Italy and Germany okay. are having second thoughts. And it's never good when they're fighting the world. That's <laughs> never a good thing. But yeah, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, like it was a done deal. So I thought I better update that and we will keep an eye on that story. All right. Well, we're running late. It's time for... The lightning round, where we wrap up the week's news in environmental news, and climate news, and electrification of the power grid and clean energy and all that. Any fast-paced look, uh, that's how we end the show every week. Hundreds, if not thousands, of weather stations in Asia today, as we record this, are at record high temperature levels, in some cases up to 5 degrees Celsius above the previous high temperatures for early March in China, 
102 stations are above the early March records. And uh, it's 21 degrees in North Korea, Ugh. 24 in South Korea. So it's it's winter, right? Celsius, Celsius, which is around, you know, 70 Fahrenheit area. Toronto was plus 15 a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, which set a record for that time in uh, in March. And then I went there and visited and, uh, you know, they had a blizzard and it was freezing. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you'd rent a Tesla or rent an e-bike or do something that we could use on the show, but no. No. You're just well, there to go to your cocaine parties and whatever it is you do, <laughs> you bohemian. Uh, I went to the Leonard Cohen show at the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and it was uh, all of Leonard's like notes and you could see his notebooks for writing his songs. I'm, I'm a big Leonard Cohen fan, so that was a lot of fun. Okay. Well, you never mentioned that before. Now we know, I guess. Okay, the U.S. Postal Service is planning to buy over 9,000 electric vehicles and 14,000 charging stations this year. Now, we've talked about this lots of times before, but I'm wondering, like, what's up with that? Why are they buying more charging stations than almost twice as many charging stations and vehicles? Are they putting one at your front step? I mean, that doesn't make <laughs> quite... I, I don't understand that. Maybe they're preparing for next year or something. I don't know. Yeah, they, they keep sort of switching these numbers around in terms of their procurement for electric vehicles, but by and large, they've been making better progress in that. So Yeah, a lot a of people thing. have criticized them for not being more ambitious because it's a perfect use case scenario for that. The Daily Beast, Elon Musk now has bodyguards flank him everywhere inside Twitter HQ. Occasionally, I like to throw in a crazy Elon Musk story. They, they accompany him to the bathroom because he thinks there's going to be a coup. This is never see that's that's what I why I worry, Brian. Is stuff like that, like the the, the yeah. dictator sort of crazy cuckoo. I've gotten too rich and too powerful and too famous. Then the presentation was like totally above board and and uh, totally sensible. So you know. We'll see. A Florida lawmaker wants to ban EVs from evacuating during hurricanes. Now, I would normally put a Florida joke in here, but uh, we, we find out we have listeners in Florida. So, you know, I'm not yeah. going to make Florida jokes anymore. I can't. Uh, unless the, the situation really calls for it. But he says the cars might stall, which is stupid because when you evacuate for a hurricane, the power's not out. You're evacuating before the damn hurricane gets there. Right. Right. And, you know, electric cars, when they are stuck in traffic, they don't use any gas. They don't. They use a small amount for heating or cooling, which you can adjust or open the windows and use a lot less of it. So there's really not a great argument there. And then when the power does come back on, because gas stations need power too, right? Well, they're yeah. often, it comes back on and they have no gas in the storage tanks because they've used it all for the evacuation. And so the electric car is your guide to get around now because they'll have yeah. power. Power equals you, you know, gas. And as long as there's a working outlet somewhere, you can charge your electric car, but you can't gas up your uh, gas car just anywhere. Okay. Uh, power was the biggest U.S. emitting sector for decades, and then it was transportation for a while. But now, and this is quite surprising to the people who follow this, the industrial sector emits more than power. Why? Because hmm. power has quickly become cleaner. Rooftop solar in Australia is set to eclipse coal as installations reach more than 20 gigawatts. So there's more than 20 nuclear reactors worth of power, peak power, on people's homes and businesses in Australia. Now, it's a great place yeah. for it. It's close to the equator. That's just, just the rooftop solar. Yeah, that's, that's not, not solar, solar farms. <laughs> that's rooftops, which is piecemeal. Which is a huge... And it's a huge thing in Australia. Lots of people have solar on their roofs, which yes, is great. Yes, it's like 25% of the homes have solar on their roofs. So a new study about seabirds and offshore wind turbines says none of the four species that they studied for two years died, zero. Now, this was done by a wind-related company, but apparently it's been vetted, and um, most people are regarding it as a legitimate study, but they're also wondering what about the other species of birds, <laughs> yeah. if there are more that are involved. But they studied four and yeah. found zero over two years. No, wind turbines have nothing to do with killing whales, but they do occasionally kill birds. I know we talked about birds of prey sometimes, um, get hit by the wind turbines because they're always looking down. The, the birds of prey are kind of looking down for prey and they oh, literally don't see the, okay. the blade in front of them. So they do kill uh, some birds, but not shorebirds, apparently. Ford files a patent for a system that could remotely possess your car. 
repossess. Repossess your car. So you don't pay it, possession it drives would, away <laughs> by itself. Possession would be like an exorcist situation. Yeah. Well, that's bad too. <laughs> <laughs> the repossess if it's possessed. It's got a, a possession indicator on it. Uh, that is our time from this week, but uh, we'll see you again next week. Clean Energy Show at gmail.com. And remember, thanks to our donors who've clicked on the link in the show notes and everyone else who supports the show in your own way. We'll see you again next time. See you next week. 